Okay, this is going to be a review for Star Trek Enterprise. Uh, Star Trek Enterprise, let's see. I started with, uh, I got a kind of like a subscription to Netflix um, in January. And my New Year's resolution was to watch more sci-fi. And so there's lots on there. And I was really nostalgic because I found a lot of stuff from like the 20th century, like the 90s. And I was watching lots of it. Um, I also found stuff from the 2000s, which uh, Star Trek Enterprise started, what, in the 2000s, like Bush era. So, yeah, I, I wasn't sure if what I, when I wanted to watch it. And then um, I had been watching a whole bunch of stuff, like, for example, Cosmos. Um, and there's a name in the credits, and it's uh, Brannon Braga, or Braga. Sounds very... Um, Celtic or Druid, doesn't it? Except I think he's actually from, like, was it Minnesota or something? Or Montana? Um, but I noticed that the shows with his name on the, in the credits, I think he's a producer, um, was stuff I really liked. Um, I was watching Terra Nova, and I was watching, gosh, all, all kinds of stuff. Uh, definitely Terra Nova. Um, I forgot, I forgot how much sci-fi I, I found stuff that was like, they'd make a series and they'd only make like one season, maybe two, and then it would get canceled. And I, I was watching these shows and I was like, this is so good, what the heck? Um, but yeah, if you, so if you've watched um, Star Trek Enterprise, Terra Nova, I think, is one of the episodes. And um, th I think it might actually be called Terra Nova. And it's like a planet, and it was like a colony, and it's like a weird story. But it's there are some similarities to that episode and Star Trek and the actual show, which was created by Ron and Braga. So yeah, I actually, if I watch, if I find TV shows, whether it's online or films, uh, Bran and Braga, I think it does good stuff. So the vis visually, everything, it's it's lovely. So. Let's see. Moving along. Okay, so first let's talk about the show um, a little bit. So some spoiler alerts past this point. Um, the show is supposed to be like a prequel to all of the other franchise things. Like everybody knows who Zephram Cochran is if you've watched any of the, um, especially like Next Generation Time and like the, the films. Uh, who was actually, he's a guy that everybody looked up to, and they have video footage of him, you know, making inspirational videos and speeches and gestures of peace and technology and so on, who actually turns out to be a drunk and moody and he's insecure, and he does all the good things, sort of, too, because he actually hates himself and all these other things. But uh, towards the end of his life, he, you know, he really does all these great stuff, like the warp engine and so on. So apparently uh, one of the people who worked with him or knew him was Jonathan Archer's father who designed the warp, the, 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 the technology that the new, that the Enterprise in Star Trek Enterprise um, uses. So he is oftentimes feels like he's in the shadow of his father. Um, and he has a dog and the dog's name is Porthos, and at the beginning of the story, um, Archer feels like he, you know, he, he kind of is like a, he wants to be a hero, and he, you know, he wants to be an explorer, but he's oftentimes really nerdy and dorky, uh, kind of a doof a lot. Uh, other than, like, his star charts and his sports, he can be clueless about things, but then he has, like, this gumption, like, oh, well, we're gonna make it, we'll somehow figure it out, we'll do we'll make it, well, yay, because we have gumption, like, I don't know, there's times where the characters in this have no, I don't know, the, the development, the character development is oftentimes not that good. Um, the actors, though, are, are fantastic, I think that, that given the crappiness of the scripts and everything, I still felt the actors really did a good job for trying, you know, work with whatever they had to work with. Um, Apparently, the, the, the time that they spend in the studio is absolutely grueling and, and that they bothers their health and they have to put up a lot of with a lot of crap just because they have that job. So, 
anyway, um, yeah, Archer, he's such a doof at times, um, that he frequently reminds me of George W. Bush, which is when the show came out, was that era, um, and then even when he goes bad, he, it just reminds me very much of the speeches that George Bush used to say, and take Dick Cheney, and it becomes really creepy and dark, and he does really terrible stuff. He, um, he has an alien cloned, uh, to, for body parts that he kills, just so he can save the life of his buddy. Um, uh, most of the crew members that he picked to be in the crew are just his buddies, like, he picked Hoshi. Not, I mean, she's, she's good and all, but it was his buddy, and then Trip was his, like, literally his bud. Um, so, there's times where you, when you're watching, like, the first two seasons, I would constantly, how did these people get this job? Are these really the best and the brightest? I don't think so. But that's just, I don't know, nepotism. So, I'll talk more about Archer again, but, uh, so, let's see. Uh, let's talk about some of the characters. Well, actually, you know what, let's talk about the theme song. It's really different, um, they have this... Dean Warwick theme song, which is sung by like an Irishman, I think. And uh, the song was good. I do like the song. It's very inspiring. Apparently, it's like a cut up version of the original song. But it just doesn't feel very Star Trek ish, even though I actually did, did like the song. Um, I don't know if it was maybe because pop music was popular back then, like around the early 2000s. Um, eh. Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know, I felt like the music score, I didn't really care in it that much either, so. Uh, let's go with some characters. Okay, so to Paul, when this series first starts out, um, I don't know, it just seems like Archer, he always just wants appropriate challenges, and he just wants to prove that he's as good as his dad, or Zephyr Cochran, or whatever. So he wants to Paul there, and to Paul is like a total bitch total bitch like I don't know how you can watch it and think like like um somehow it's like an ethnocentric like oh she didn't well she didn't mean it that way no she did she's really stuck up really a punk I mean the whole thing with the dinner scene the, she's cutting up a breadstick with a fork and a knife I mean it's just ridiculous um also the Vulcans in the show are just not good. They're not good people, but then it, at, towards the end they rewrote it and changed it that, oh, well, they were actually, the whole time they were lying, actually they like humans and everything, but they couldn't dare admit it, so they put on a fake, like, facade, you know, like they were actually jerks, and actually they were behind the scenes helping everything po in a positive way, but acting like a jerk to make you think that they weren't, or, like, it just... I don't know why you had to write it that way. I liked the, all the other series, Vulcans were so much really great characters, and whereas these were, eh. Also, like, I, the Romulan things in this, just, I don't know why they messed that up, and then how come you randomly have Ferengi in the show? Because Ferengi don't even show up until Star Trek The Next Generation in, like, what, the first episode, or first two or three episodes in the first season? So, where are these Ferengi coming from? That's just ridiculous. Um, I think they did that a few times with some other species as well, which I just thought, like, come on, maybe you should actually hire people to write these episodes that actually watch the show and have seen them all and actually like the show. Like, because Next Generation actually had scripts that were written by fans. Um, so, that's why it was good. Um, anyway, to Paul... From the neck down, she has this great figure. From the neck up, they made her look very, like, man-ish, which is weird because the actress herself is gorgeous, but she has this very, like, she looks very boyish when, I don't know, when she's in costume, when she's in makeup, when she's got the hair and everything. She looks like a guy, except from the neck down. So it's kind of strange. Um, let's go to Dr. Flox. Okay, Dr. Flox, is, I noticed, um, a lot of people like Dr. Flux. Um, I just don't like the way his character was frequently written and rewritten and it didn't make it didn't it wasn't consistent. Like in the beginning, 
Like, you find out that he has um, multiple spouses, and his spouses have multiple spouses, and that's just their culture, and um, they're okay with that. But then he has his assistant who is, like, hitting on him, and it's kind of like dating him, or I don't know, it's like gray area, right? But then, apparently, the his species doesn't like to be touched, right? Um, so he's skittish, he's nervous, even though he's been around all kinds of different alien species, but he's just suddenly nervous about this. But he's a doctor, and he always has to touch people. But then, when his one of his spouses comes, and... Uh, Every freaking alien has a crush on Trip. Everyone. Every, all aliens will have a crush on Trip. And, of course, his wife has a giant crush on Trip. Like, she's got a heart on constantly for Trip. And Dr. Flox is, like, all touchy-feely. And he's like, oh, well, you don't know what you're missing. You know, you should totally, like, you know, get it on with my wife. And, and Trip was, like, actually, like, creeped out by it. Like, I don't want to get with her after she's been with you. And also, it just felt like, um... The his uh, he Flux wasn't really into that specific wife, and she just looked like she was so fiending for like some action, like she was so like horny, like crazy. Um, uh, as far as Trip goes, Trip I frequently got confused with uh, Malcolm for like the first uh, season. I don't know why, because they don't even have the same accent. Um, but. Trip at first, I couldn't stand him. Uh, he's like such a dork nerd. Uh, he could be impulsive at times, um, but then so could um, Malcolm, which he, even though he's supposed to be Mr. Proper, he could still be impulsive. Um, uh, but yeah, all the aliens have a crush. If there's a new alien that, like, if it's a first contact or a new alien or some alien shows up, they will all have a crush on Trip every freaking time. Like, one of them knocked him up and got him pregnant. Uh, there was, like, these wispy ones that, like, would go into his head and sort of possess him, and then he's, like, getting high off of, like, bonding with these wispy alien being things. Um, then he's, like, on a prison ship, and the guy in the, on the, the prison ship uh, for the slave labor thing he starts having a giant bro crush on him. Like, no matter what Trip does, it's like aliens are crazy about him. Then, eventually, there's this thing with the... Because of Dr. Flux, he recommends to Paul give Trip a, some point massage, a pressure massage treatments or whatever. So he has to go and do that. And they were... They, they really tried to be, like, as nonchalant about it and, like, professional or whatever, but then feelings start to, um, I don't know, happen. They start bonding, even though they originally couldn't stand each other at all. But once he starts having, like, this sort of semi- this bonding with uh, to Paul, um... I actually started to like Trip more, whereas before I couldn't stand him. I really just didn't like him, the, the, the character. Um, and I don't like the way that they wrote it the towards the end. Like, I felt like they really could have done something with it. And it was just, like, slacker writing, like, the end of Voyager when they... Like, I don't like the way they handled the relationship with Chakotay in Seven of Nine, which had potential to be really good. And they just... Oh, now they're dating! Like, it just didn't make any sense. But with the trip... Um, and to Paul, that was absolutely needlessly tragic, and it didn't have to go. I just, why? Of all of the ways you could have written it, why that way? Um, let's see. Hoshi. Hoshi is also one of the, one of, uh, Archer's buddies, and, um, she's, like, a prodigy, and she's, like, a whiz kid, and, oh, she's not a kid. She's a, a Asian stereotype. She speaks all these different languages, and has all these abilities to do all these like cognitive type stuff but she's claustrophobic she's a wuss uh she's has like nervousness issues and she um she also has like some kind of black belt in aikido and she's some kind of martial arts master 
okay. Um, she also apparently, like, you think, she wants everybody to think that she's, like, this goody-goody constantly because she's a nerd, but then she has, like, this evil side, like, not evil, but, like, this really naughty side that she, like, hides. Like, apparently she was some kind of gambling ring, um coordinator once and she almost like got kicked out of school for it and uh she has these like like her martial arts skills are like deadly and uh when they go on vacation to like was it Rigel or Riza or something um she acts like she's all a prude and everyone else is trying to get laid and she's like oh well, I'm not doing that I'm gonna you know I'm just gonna relax and read and you know learn some language and actually she gets all slutty with this um alien guy there the whole time and then when she comes back she like lies about it and she's like oh I was just you know doing nerdy stuff like for sure whatever um let's see read Malcolm Reed okay when this the show started off um they like I think it was in the first season like you're trying to get to know Malcolm Reed and he even comes with uh, up with like the read alert which is like the red alert and uh he has good ideas and so but he starts to become more impulsive and a jerk and macho and like I don't know it just I get I don't know if it's like Napoleon syndrome where it's like short guys always get approved their biggest their dick is bigger or something but um and he's always scowling and and you know Mr. Security I'm so awesome and whatever but at the beginning he's so um prudish boring nerd, geek, dork, um, like, not fun, and very private, keeps to himself, there's, like, this episode where they try to figure out what kind of food he liked, and it turned out to be pineapple, and he completely changes, he completely changes, like, like a, a 180 in his personality, he becomes, like, this nice, proper, sweet guy, and then becomes, like, Mr. Jerk, Mr. Brash, he's always quick to start a fight, and an argument, Get, he, he can't stand any question, any any concern. He always thinks it's like a, um, a challenge to his authority or something. He just completely devolves as a person. And then in the first few episodes, like he acts like he's like, oh, oh, European, this is great. European, that is great. But then you find out he's freaking Malaysian. Okay, he's a Caucasian Malaysian. And he's from Kota Baru, and so is his family, and they all live there. Like... Uh, you're Asian, dude. You're not European. You're maybe, like, ethnic European, but you're Asian. So, okay, I don't know what, what you know, what went on with that. Um, and then there's Travis. Travis, I think, is probably one of the best written characters in the whole main crew. Um, he's really handsome. He's a nice guy. He's a really good guy. He's really smart. He's really resourceful. Um, I think he's actually on par with Trip, which, who I think Trip, by the end of the series, becomes, like, Mr. Super Whiz Geek Guy, and he, like, he's like Scotty or O'Brien, where he can just magically fix things with the technology and whatever. But, like, Travis is quite the resourceful person, and he's the only one, even though he, he comes from, like, a his background is, like, he's from some miners and stuff, and he, you know, broke away from that to be in Starfleet. Um, he doesn't have that kind of chip-on-the-shoulder thing like everyone else. Like, everyone has this chip-on-the-shoulder thing. Even Flocks has some kinds of that. Um, but with Travis, of the few episodes where they actually, like, get into his character, because they barely do anything, and I feel so bad for that, that actor, because that actor was really good um real I mean he was I also don't know why there, there was barely any romance with him nothing he was a great character he was like in a way in some way similar to Jordy LaForge um he was very friendly like even like Commander Riker he had this like friendliness about him uh like he just seemed like somebody you just want to hang out with you, you like if you were on in that crew you'd probably want to hang out with um with Travis because he was He's just so cool, and everyone else is such dorks. Like, Travis wasn't a dork. He just was, he was just all around really cool, really good. Um, yeah, he just, why? Why didn't you do more with Travis? Like, why not? Uh, let's see. What else? Um, okay, so 
there's also some um, there's different things in in this if you if you're a real big Trekkie there's certain things in the show that they that that, that are in the show um, like hidden from other parts of the franchise like there's one there's an episode where there's like a ship that's called the uh, Kiri Kirin which if you I think it's on Star Trek four or five the films uh, where Spock is he's taking some tests and it asks him about the, you know, what, what was Kitty Keating? It was like a guy who was, a um, it was like a Vulcan philosopher. Like what was his first metaphysical rule or something like that? And it actually was borrowed from like A Course in Miracles, which is nothing unreal exists. So it was something like that. But yeah, so Kitty Keating, that's, that's in there. Um, I don't know if I pronounced it right, but that's in there. Um, and then as the show starts getting, get going, well, let's see. First two seasons, boring, kind of, eh. And I want to put this out there, like, I hate, hate, hate shuttle pod episodes. I think shuttle pod episodes should just be banned. They are so boring. They're not interesting. Although I do think probably the actors themselves probably like it because it gets to showcase like a focus on their acting skills. Like, you know, they're dying or they're running out of air or they're freezing to death or they cry on cue or they get, to, you know, they really get to get into these, um, expressive type, you know, shots and close-ups and, and, you know, do a lot of the, like, like, real, really acting out, but I just really don't like them. I don't like the shuttle pod episodes at all. Sorry, actors. But, um, I mean, their acting's great, but I hate them. They're boring. It's the same setting. It drags on. It's the whole episode stuck in a shuttle pod and you're gonna die or you're lost or you're gonna get captured or whatever I just I hate shuttle pod episodes please don't ever write anymore like any scenes in shuttle pods should just be like a few minutes and that's it I just don't want any more shuttle pod episodes ever never ever so yay um so yeah so first and second season the crew is very nostalgic and you know they're gonna explore and they're gonna make first contact and they're gonna do all this great stuff and well maybe we're not very good at this but we got you know we have gumption we're gonna make it we're gonna do it we're gonna make it happen it'll be like manifest destiny sort of um I don't know and and to Paul I mean I can understand because because it's like yeah maybe you should actually think about what you're doing you should actually plan but Archer is such a dork sometimes, like, he just doesn't think about, oh, well, I should plan this, or I should strategize this, or I should, you know, this makes sense, and that makes sense. No, he's just like, oh, my star charts, and, oh, sports are on. Like, what? Star charts and, what was it, water polo or water volleyball or something? Ugh, whatever. Yeah, so maybe if you put more you know, energy and actually, like, doing your job, you know, Archer, maybe, you know, things would actually go a lot better. And then Reed and Trip, they always have good ideas, but they don't always get, you know, attention. They don't necessarily listen. So, because the captain is like, well, chef, my, my chef, uh, um, Porthos, or, oh, my Star Charts, um, and sports water volleyball or whatever so I don't know at times I just wonder like how the heck did he get that job like he's such a doof like he's such a doof yeah. ah. whatever um but then as you get to like what was it season three or the end of season two it's where you have this like where it becomes like 9-11 and you have all these like aliens and there's always this weird time travel thing with shifting timelines which seems to be a theme that pops in and out with Star Trek not a lot but it does you know pop in and out in the the franchise especially like in the films and some of the shows as well but this kind of time travel theme constantly comes up in Star Trek Enterprise I think it might have been because um 
like Doctor Who started to become popular a, a bit at the time. Um, so there's a lot of that. Um, but this the Zindi, um, they do this attack on the Earth and blame them for some future crime that nobody ever did, and which actually never happened, and it's all this manipulation, and so then the crew of the Enterprise becomes like, I mean, it's so Bush era, where like, you know, you're going to read in, Invade Iraq, even though it had nothing to do with 9-11, and, and then the crew becomes nasty people. It's very un-Star Trek. It's very anti-Gene Roddenberry. Like, I'm sure that Gene Roddenberry would be livid if he ever knew that they did this with his franchise. But, um, Captain Archer becomes a really dark man, a really bad guy. He becomes like a pirate. He robs and pillages. Um, he tortures. And he it's like he's like, oh, we, we can't forget why we're human. You know? And then he'll go and torture again. Like, he tortures. He even, uh, like, he has a chip on his shoulder still. And he's like, I'll never be as good as my father. I'll never be like Zephram Cochran, right? And then he takes a little statuette of Zephram Cochran and impales a guy with it. Like, it becomes very, like, totalitarian. Um, it becomes very, like, anti, you know, human rights, or not so much human, but, like, I don't know, like, proper behavior, or, and so on. And this is the guy who's supposed to start, you know, found the Federation, the founder of the Federation. Um, and eventually, you know, Archer does become the founder of the Federation, but not actually because... You know, he was inspired to, and it's for the greater good, and all this. No, it's because he's so ashamed, and he did so many terrible things, and he doesn't want that to happen again. And even though he many times was sort of like trying, you know, like cognitive dissonance, sort of rationalize in his head so he wouldn't feel as bad about it. And then he'd always hate himself afterwards because he did all these really bad things. And then even Reed, Malcolm Reed, I couldn't stand him. But towards the end, I felt like Trip became a much better character. And it was, and I started to actually like T'Pol even though I couldn't stand her in the beginning. But I just didn't like the way they were, they wrote the character's relationship. They could have really done a lot better with that. But the whole end of the show, the, the, especially the last season, it just got really tragic and really painful. It became very... Yeah, I, I cried because the the day when the, the Federation, it was setting up and Archer was making his, like, his speech and everything, his crew sat there in the bleachers or the seats or whatever, and they're not proud they're not happy. They're actually ashamed of what they did. And, and future generations of people are going to look up to them and admire them for like founding the Federation and peace and all this great stuff, when in actuality, what they did was terrible. They did horrible things. They did shameful things. Um, and Trip was Trip died. Trip was dead. So they were grieving and mourning for Trip, and, you know, it really wasn't their proudest moment, even though it should have been. It was, you know, I'm going to do this, not be, you know, be because I did the wrong thing, and I'm ashamed of what I did. Uh, it was kind of pathetic, um, and it was just very quiet. The, the, the funny thing was um, the last episode wasn't even presented as the, an actual show. It was like an episode of The Next Generation, Star Trek Next Generation. It was um, Commander Riker and his wife, uh, Deanna Troy, and uh, he was trying to get some kind of inspiration or whatever from their perspective and actually the thing is like you never find out who chef is ever but then um Riker is playing the role of chef in the hol holodeck um and because it's in a holodeck everybody looks very glossy and like they have like this really great makeup and um 
you know, they're they're very pretty looking, whereas in the actual show, they're, they're nowhere near like that. And then before that, there was like this alternative reality, uh, like, uh, I think it was like in the original Star Trek series, where it's like evil, evil Captain Archer, <laughs> which um, <laughs> was weird. And they have like a, what, an old Star Trek ship. And I don't know, I feel like there was probably lots of stuff that was written and then they were canceling a show, and they're like, okay, we'll just pick some stuff and didn't just shoot it. And, you know, just air it or something. Um, yeah, I was just very disappointed with that show. Um, but um, it, I still watched it. I still kept watching it. Um, I still think the actors were lovely. Um, I thought they did a, the actors themselves, you know, given whatever they had to work with, because apparently the sets were tiny. Um, I thought they did a pretty good job. I just think the writers didn't. Um, <laughs> the writers could have written a lot better things. I don't know what they were thinking at all. Um, but you did get to see some stuff. I mean, it, it, because of the... I think they get away with a lot of changing everything because of the alternative realities. Just like the new Star Trek films, which I do like, but I don't like what they did with Kirk's character so much. Um, even though I thought the actor was fabulous. Um, yeah, the, the Star Trek Enterprise. Why did they write it that way? Um, you know what? I'd love to see this show redone. Like, redone totally. Or have films of it. Which I think would be better. Um, oh, and... One more thing, my favorite character. Okay, so usually when I watch TV shows that I like, especially sci-fi and Star Trek, there's always um, a character that will usually end up being my favorite. Um, <clears throat> and of course it's generally people in the main characters or the crew. So I was watching it, and my god, like the first season, I got to the end, and I was like, I still don't have a favorite character. Second season, not sure, not really sure yet. And then about the end of the season two, getting into season three, I'm like, oh, I know who my favorite character is. Um, it's Tran. Um, he's not even a main character, but um. He is this blue guy, blue alien guy with little int movable antennae things, and he looks like Clint Eastwood, and even talks like Clint Eastwood, and he originally starts out as this bad guy, like a kind of like a pirate, like this militant kind of Andorian aliens, and as he comes back, he it turns out he has a conscience, and he always feels like he has to be better than this or better than that and when he does the wrong thing he will feel guilty he will feel ashamed and he'll feel like oh I owe him or he did the right thing and I did the wrong thing I need to do that I need to be better than that he will then vacillate a few times because he's it's like his original nature of like a militant nasty guy kind of it's still there in his ego and then his conscience will kind of take over and he's like I regret that, or maybe I shouldn't have done this, maybe I should have done it a different way, and then he'll want to rectify it, and he'll go back and forth uh, and vacillate in this a bit until he really starts to have more of a sense of who he is and who he wants to be, what he'd like to be like, and he doesn't always want to admit that, because there are actually some good things about Archer, even though he does really terrible things. And it's those good things, especially in the beginning when he first met Archer, that he's just like, I... I'll never be as good as that. I need to be as good as that. Or or I need to make peace. And then he even stands up to his own people, his own crew. He, you know, he, he really cannot, he really understands a lot of things. And then it's like his sort of, his cognitive thinking and philosophical ideas of things really start churning. And he starts to really change his views and perspective, you know, about what he, who he is, what he's done, you know, maybe fighting is bad, maybe da, 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 da. maybe it doesn't have to be this way, maybe it can be another way, which was like the original way that Archer was. And so I think the having Shran and Archer interact together actually will at times 
bring Archer back to the good to the good guy he was, because uh, he uh, at times can be a villain, <laughs> Archer. And then Shran, who was originally written as a villain, as many times a hero. So um, I just love Shran when there's an episode with Shran where he suddenly shows up. I just get all happy about it. And um, even on like my Tumblr, I put a photo of Shran on there because I like Shran. Yeah, I love Shran. I don't know how long Andorians are supposed to live. Like I know Vulcans live a very long time, but if they did live a very long time, I would love to see Shran in other series and films and so on. Like he is so such a great character. Like they really did a good character right there. Like, as far as character development goes, I think that was the best of them all. Like, they did everything right with him. They didn't do anything wrong with him. He is perfect. He needs to be in more stories, shows, episodes, whatever. Shran is just the best. He's so good. He should definitely have more Shran. And, um, I guess that's it, huh? Well, I'm... I'm watching Deep Space Nine now, which I actually never watched them all, and I recall that I didn't always like it. I thought it was often kind of boring, because it's just a space station. Um, so, yeah, I guess I'll probably have to do a review of that. Anyway, was there anything else worth saying? Oh, the, 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 the clone guy. Um, this is one of those really weird, creepy, but yet interesting things with uh, Trip and Flox and Archer and T'Pol. Um, Dr. Flox actually cloned this guy uh, from Trip to use his organs uh, to allegedly save Trip, which he might not have even been able to recover. And the clone, which I think his name was Sim or Sid or something, um, was so much better than Trip. I liked him 